Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reaper's Digest. This, uh, this evening, we're going to discuss a couple of our favorite films, uh, a couple of psychotronic B-movie classics. My name is Duke Ralston. Blake, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Blake Ray, and, and I am so excited to talk about these movies. Man. I am too. Before we get into that, I know you're excited about something else today. Yeah, my uh, my EP came out. I am Excellent. the lead singer in the band Blood Oaks, and our mm -hmm. EP dropped on the 21st. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this, you can go download it on bandcamp.com slash Blood Oaks. Yes. Or it should be streaming everywhere very soon. Yep, yep. Uh, went and downloaded my copy yesterday. I've been listening to the songs. It's a fantastic album. If you don't have it, you need to get it. Uh, as always, I want to remind everybody to watch Tennessee Macabre. We're on Thursday night on Tingler TV. We'll be on uh, Saturday night on ITV Chattanooga at 10 o'clock Central Time. And then at midnight, we will be on Other Worlds TV. So excellent, excellent, and you just showed one of the movies we're talking about. We just did. We just showed uh, uh, Killer Shrews last Saturday night on ITV Chattanooga. We showed it here locally in South Pittsburgh as well. One of my favorite flicks. One of the first flicks we hosted. Uh, this is one of our early efforts, and uh, uh, love the movie. Love it. Why and don't you? The Killer you, Shrews and the Giant yeah. Heel Monster today, right? Yes, we are. Both films were produced by Ken Curtis of Gunsmoke fame and directed by Ray Kellogg. And Ray Kellogg had been in special effects for one of the studios. Uh, they were made for the local Southwestern drive-in circuit. But unlike a lot of films that were made for the drive-in circuit, they did receive uh, regional, and national, and international distribution. So that's just kind of a broad generalization about both films. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about The Killer Shrews? Well, The Killer Shrews comes out in 1959. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it was shot for the Southwest Drive-In Circuit. It was shot outside of Dallas, Texas, produced back-to-back -back with the giant Gila monster. Mm -hmm. Gila monster, sorry. <laughs> I uh, do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's hard not to do. You know, there's yeah. a G. There's a G. You gotta say that G, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it's since lapsed into the public domain. Mm -hmm. Um, it's basically about this guy and his first mate delivering supplies to a remote island. Um, there's a scientist there and his research assistant and the scientist's daughter and her former fiance and a servant all living on the island. Right? Right. But before they get too settled in, they the scientist... He's like, you gotta go. You gotta get out of here, man. And uh, they don't because there's a hurricane coming up. Mm -hmm. Then they uh, have a few drinks, talk about what the scientist's been doing. Long story short, he's been growing giant shrews. The idea is he wants to isolate the DNA code where... It's a lot of science mumbo jumbo. Basically, he wants to shrink people in order to create less hunger. Question? Mark? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But instead of that, he just made giant shrews. Yeah. Who were his test animals? They attack, and the rest is history. 
Yes. You know, you've got these uh, dogs and Afghans, it looks like, uh, chewing through the walls of an adobe house. It's, it's an awesome movie. Yes, it is. It really is. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, and um, one of the things that I love about this movie, there's a lot, there's a lot of B movies out there like this. The 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 drive-in circuit in the 50s and 60s, even the early 70s, you could go out and produce a movie regionally and turn a profit on it, you know, at the drive-in. So a lot of folks did this. Problem is, most of the folks that did it did not have access to decent actors, did not have good scripts, and... Uh, a lot of times didn't have good cinematography. No. And these are all things that both these films excel at. Uh, the, the cinematography in uh, Killer Shrews is fantastic. The acting is fantastic. James Best, who is, he plays uh, Sherman, is... You know, he's better known for his role in the Dukes of Hazard, And so if you just know him, and, and I would say that most people, he did a lot of bit roles in Western series and stuff in the 50s and 60s. Did a lot of TV. But if you just know James Best from those two things, you probably don't take him too serious. But James Best was a college professor who taught acting. He was an acting coach and he served as a mentor for many years for a lot of young actors. Um, the guy was really talented. So you had that kind of that kind of uh, acting in, involved. And then Ken Curtis, of course, had a famous acting career uh, with Gunsmoke. And a lot of these guys in these movies end up going to the Western TV shows. I've yeah, yes. I don't know yes. what that's about. That was a huge, huge market for actors in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Western series that, you know, I kind of caught the tail end of that. Gunsmoke was still airing when I was a young child. There was a Western called High Chaparral that I remember. But by the time I was born in 67, that industry was dying out. You go back 10 years earlier, about half the stuff that's coming on TV is a Western serial. And so they were pulling people out of the, the Southwest and the South that um, could pass accent-wise for being Western actors. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, the Killer Shrews is interesting to me. Yeah. Because, one, it's one of my favorite of the B movies. Yes. Um, I think because it's swinging for the fences. Yes. You know, um, and I talk a lot about B movies and camp and things like that. I love campy movies. I yes. Do. Yes. But there's a certain amount of aware camp and unaware camp. Yes. I don't care for aware camp. I generally don't either. It's It seems put upon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It seems to insist upon itself. There, There is, I think, a way to handle it where it can be okay. I, I was uh, telling you earlier, there was a sequel to The Killer Shrews. And it actually um, came out in 2011. So it was the longest period between an original and a sequel ever in Hollywood history. Or maybe we should say Dallas history. That's where it was filmed. Yeah. But uh, there was no way to film that sequel without... I mean, you, you know you're making a campy film. Yeah. And they treated it as such. They, uh, James Best had brought in some cast members from uh, Dukes of Hazard. There was kind of an oblique reference to that. It was funny, and they made it funny, you know. 
but I, as a general rule, I agree with you. I don't like camp made for camp's sake. I like people who are taking it serious. Yeah. And the, the killer shrews, they're taking it serious. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said here about the 50s in general. Uh-huh. And the late 50s, early 60s. Um, so you have this island, right? Uh-huh. Right. I'm going to argue that this is actually like radiation gothic. Yes. You know, I'll buy that. If I can define it for you real quick, let, allow me to sizzle it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you have the gothic, which is isolation, inversion, and the macabre, right? Yes. Yes. So isolation, you're on an isolated island, there's a hurricane coming, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That raises the stakes. That's part of the good writing we're talking about, right? Yes, right. You get them there, you isolate them. You have inversion. Shrews are known for being very small. Now all of a sudden they're big. Mm -hmm. You know, scientists trying to shrink mankind accidentally inflates the other. So you've got the inversion and then you've got the macabre. You know, the mad science of it all. Yes. Yes. So I think that in a way, this becomes uh, this becomes its own sort of genre of film. Definitely, definitely in the fifties. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you have. I mean, I would say that that radiation gothic is what probably 90% of the horror movies coming out in the 50s for the drive-in circuit are. Yeah. Uh, think about them. Yes. Um, That's exactly what I was thinking about. But yes. Yeah. Them, I feel like by the time we got to the Killer Shrews, what's so intriguing to me is how we've sort of run out of animals to make giant. Yeah. You know, when you get to the shrews, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, baby. <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, you know what would be bad if it was giant rats? No, we already did rats. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what about ants? No, we already did ants. Did that. Uh, yeah. Scorpions, Ray Harryhausen did that. <laughs> so you got just, you know, this movie was made on a shoestring, too. Yes, yes. Um, I think I read it was $125,000. Yeah. Yeah. Not even and, 23. And that's kind of, uh, you know, to me, if there's a psychotronic meter, you know, which is kind of something we played with in a, in a past episode. Okay. You got the low budget. I think radiation Gothic almost by default is a psychotronic movie, you know, but a lot of the radiation gothic movies that are coming out of the 50s are low budget. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you've got the regionalism and the fact that it is made specifically for the drive in circuit. Well, yeah. Also, there's this idea of getting along with what you have. Yes. So, and the trippy visuals that creates <laughs> the coon dogs coon dogs and in, in true suits <laughs> yeah but yeah. it works yeah it, it works uh, it does and uh, because of the suspension of disbelief yeah yeah it works yeah, yeah. And, you know the lights are going down in the drive-in they play that famous intro music and then mm -hmm. boom they're off you're suspending disbelief and there are things weirder in heaven and hell than they're dreamed of in all of their philosophy, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, but it, it reminds me of something from my childhood, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I was part of a community theater. Yeah. So, and I say kid, I was like mm, 17. Yeah. Uh, I thought there'd be a lot of girls in drama. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I joined up. and um, Which is why you do everything at 17. 
<laughs> why I play guitar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I was 17, we did a production of The Hobbit. Yes. So in order to get the sizes right. Right. They cast a five foot two uh, girl as the Hobbit. Uh huh. They cast average sized dudes as the dwarves. Right. And they cast a six foot seven t- foot a uh, six foot seven inch tall man as Gandalf. Wow. It was shocking. It was. I bet it was. It was, uh, it was just psychedelic in a weird way. Yeah. You know, because you have this, like, you're playing with perspective without meaning to. Right, right. You know, and the Killer Shrews does that to a certain extent. Because you know those are dogs. Yeah. Objective. Yeah. But the fangs, the wigs, the whole thing. It it creates this bizarre kind of uncanny valley thing. I think that's it does. It does. When you when you watch the movie, if the movie had not been well written and well acted, it wouldn't work. But the fact that you get into the movie and and you really you really you really like James Best. You can't help but like James Best. And the fact that and of course we haven't mentioned Ingrid Good, who was uh, 1956 Miss Sweden and second runner-up to 1956 Miss Universe. You can't help but like her. Yeah, and she's and a pretty decent actress. Well. She's a pre- she's a really good actress, and uh, of course you you hate Ken Curtis's character because we all know that character. Yeah, we all know that guy, and. And so you are, you immediately are drawn into that tension. And you're in the story almost from the get go. You see how it's going to go. And so that makes it a lot easier to buy those coon hounds in shrew suits. You know, uh, I think you, you say you know how it's going to go. And I think that's because it's a very classic storyline. Yes. You know, um, you know how the love triangle is going to go. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. The killer shrews. You probably need to go talk to somebody. Yeah, yeah. You can't predict that, but but what I'm saying is, you you buy into that human story, that love triangle between uh, the the bad guy, the good guy, and the beautiful woman. Yeah, you get that. We've all been there. We've all been there. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, though, that we take something that is so classic in Western literature, mm-hmm. love triangle, yes. and we inject something so surreal. Yes. And I think that juxtaposition between the surreal uh-huh. and the common is where you get a lot of the psychotronic film. Absolutely. Absolutely, you know, I agree. That's that's a good point. Uh, uh, it is. It is. You you get that uh, that unique blend. You know, it's, it reminds me of the uh, the El Santo. Movies, yes, where he's going about his daily life, suit and tie, and a luchador. <laughs> yes, There's and uh, something so surreal about it. Well, you know, you know who I live with, so it's not as surreal to me as it is. With us. <laughs> well, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there there is this surreal quality to it. You're entering, I think, you're entering another world. You know, and it does a lot. It takes a lot of great steps to push you into another world. Yes. You know, isolating you on the island. Yes. And then there's super science going on. And then there's a hurricane. Yes. And then you're not allowed in the woods at night. And then, and so on and so on, right? Yes. Yes. Now, conversely, the giant Gila monster mm-hmm. 
takes place in what would be a thriving community. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's a there's some differences here. Uh, let's just talk about the kind of the plot line. You know, this is very much a teenage oriented movie. We've got a lot of teenagers. And it opens up, there's a young couple, uh, they're out parking in, in the Texas scrub, and then they're attacked by a giant Gila monster, overturns the car and kills them. Uh, their buddy is kind of the older teenage kid, and he has a good relationship with the sheriff and he's working at a garage and uh, he's kind of one of these kids, he's a hot, he's a hot rodder and so there are folks in the town that, that, that just don't like him no matter what he does. There's also a little subplot, he has a sister with a handicap that he's trying to help, he's trying to help take care of. Another subplot, he's trying to work out enough money to go to college. So there's lots of little tropes going on here also the, somebody is a up-and-coming rock star right yes he's also an up-and-coming rock star yes he's got a lot going on he's got a lot going on but he kind of he, he's kind of the leader of this group and, and it, it's clear from the get-go that the sheriff comes to him to deal with the group and uh the sheriff comes to him to ask him help hunt for these kids well one of the kids is the son of the wealthiest guy in town. And uh, he wants to blame Chase. Uh, Chase is the guy, Chase Winstead, played by Don Sullivan. He's he's the leader of the group. And he wants to blame him because he's a hot rodder. And of course, the kids go out and find the wreckage. They pull it up. Um, there are several more wrecks in the meantime. Each one is caused by the Gila monster who then eats the drivers. And uh, the local DJ is also uh, Rex drunk. And you get a really neat suspenseful scene where you see the Gila monster moving through the scrub, but he doesn't attack for some reason. Maybe he's full of hot rodders. We don't know. But uh, the disc jockey is drunk, and so Chase tows him in, sobers him up, fixes his car. And so the disc jockey comes down and does this rock and roll party for him. Well, by this time, uh, the wealthy guy, Compton, I'm mean, sorry, Mr. Wheeler, has, uh, has forced the sheriff to go and arrest Chase. And then the Gila monster attacks. And at the end of it, Chase drives a carload of nitroglycerin, loads his hot rod with nitroglycerin and uses it as a missile to kill the giant Gila monster. Now, the interesting thing about this movie is there's no real explanation given for the giant Gila monster. The sheriff, um, sheriff, sheriff Jeff and um, Chase kind of talk about gigantism in some species. They kind of talk around the subject. But there's no mad science. There's just a giant Gila monster wandering around the Texas scrub. It it remind it reminds me of some of the best and worst things you'll see in literature. Where yeah. They go, okay, explanation. They just hang a lampshade on it. Saying, yes. Okay. Sometimes things get big. Moving yes. on. Yes, exactly, exactly. Moving on, we got a big lizard. It's eating hot rodders. Somebody needs to do something. Yeah. Meanwhile, I've got to try and get this record contract going and go yeah. to college and complete my hot rod and help my sister. Yes, and take care of all these younger kids. And I have a beautiful girlfriend who is also a French runner-up for Miss Universe. Somebody had a connection with the Miss Universe pageant. Must have. Yeah. Because you got them coming in, uh, and the acting in this is not as good as the Killer Shrews. No, it's not. But it's 
in a lot of ways more earnest. Yeah. Yeah. That you've got sense. you've got some neat people in this. Uh, Shug Fisher, who plays Old Man Harris, mm -hmm. it was a regional comedian. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, um, this was kind of a, a big role for him and he, he does lighten it. He is a good comedian. There is Ken Knox who plays the DJ. He was the actual KLIF Dallas radio station disc jockey. And this was a time period when your when your big city disc jockeys that was a big deal. Oh yeah. And so he's actually more or less playing himself. And then of course you got Jose the Mexican beaded lizard. Yeah. <laughs> he he is actually a Mexican beaded lizard, not a Gila monster. And uh, of course they do the perspective thing with a live beaded lizard, which I think that's kind of neat. Yeah, it's a uh, it's something you saw in uh, some of the early dinosaur movies. Yes, yes. You would see, or uh, what was that movie? The the tarantula movie was it just called tarantula? Tarantula, yes. Yeah, where they just filmed the spider so close. Yes, it's a perspective thing, and. So here you hit some, some major tropes for psychotronic cinema as well. You've got uh, you've got a you've got a bunch of kids, a bunch of hot rodders, both tropes that you see in psychotronic cinema all the time. Uh, you've got a good relationship between these kids and the local sheriff. They're working together to fight the monster. And uh, I mean how much more psychotronic do you get than a giant beat it, the giant giant Gila monster? I mean, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's like a West Texas Godzilla, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and uh, both of these movies, and I, I would be remiss without mentioning it, have absolutely bonkers posters. Yes. Yes. The Killer Shrews, the poster is, if you've not seen it, it says all that was left after the Killer Shrews. And it's just a rat tail. Yep. And some blood. Yep. And a pink high heel. Yep. Which is disturbing. Yes. And the giant heel monster has a giant lizard claw pulling two kids out of a hot rod. Yep. Yep. Um, both of those, the visual representation, neither of those scenes actually happen in the movie. Nope. But that's not important because sensationalism is the word of the day. That's right. You got to catch people's attention, you know? Yep. If you're thinking about what they're competing with, you know, drive-in movie, West Texas. Yep. You know, you've got a lot to uh, compete with. Happening yes, driving. absolutely. And you got to catch people's attention somehow. Yep, yep. And that drive-in, you know, in in uh, the late fifties, the sixties, rural South, rural Texas, that drive-in is the focal point of teenage life. Uh, drive-in, uh, roller roller rink, and the bowling alleys are where kids congregate. So there would have been a lot of stuff going through these drive-ins, and of course, a lot of it would have been geared toward the region you're in. That's another kind of neat thing about this. You have these are regional, so these folks, you know, if you're a kid, you go to the drive-in, and most of the people on these sets talk like you do. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. You know? Um, I I don't often hear guys with accents like you and me in the Hollywood movies. No, I almost never do. Unless you know, part of the joke. Yeah, exactly. And this is uh, this is just the opposite. I mean, you know, if if you're sitting in, I mean, even you know, Tennessee and and Texas accents are close enough that I'm sitting there going, I'm perfectly comfortable talking to these guys. Yeah. <laughs> You know, 
So uh, that's that's a big deal. Yeah. So um, plus, I mean, let's talk about the cars. What is what oh, is yeah. the car have to? Do? It, it signifies independence. Right? Yes. Yes. And it's produced at a time when the interstate system is making the car an integral part of American life. Exactly. Right? And and jalopies, and it, this is the time that that term comes about, a 16-year-old could go out and buy a Model A. Yeah. Uh, or a Model, or, or a 32 Coupe, a Deuce Coupe. And, you know, if you knew what you were doing, and Chase obviously did, uh, you could you could make that thing roadworthy, and off-road worthy. It, it amazes me that they take you know he's he looks like he's driving a Deuce Coupe, and he has no qualms taking it off-road. Yeah, you know, full and, of nitroglycerin, no less. And full of nitroglycerin should have had some qualms about that one, but you know. Yeah. Uh, but if you're sitting there with the runner-up for Miss Universe and you know, a, a deuce coupe that's tricked out and a truck load of nitroglycerin, hey, if you got to go, that's the way to go. <laughs> I will say that. Like, when you, when you say this stuff out loud, like the situations in these movies, it's absolutely uh -huh. insane. Like, yeah. You know? So yeah, there it I is. was with a beauty queen in my souped up deuce coupe full yeah. of nitro. Full of nitro, heading across the cornfield to the giant Gila monster. Yeah. It's, you know, it's wild. It is wild. And it is, we're moving away from the time where you have a car culture. Yeah. There's still folks out there that are doing car shows, still folks out there that are doing drag races, but that when you go to one of these car shows, most of those folks uh, would have been teenagers in the 50s yeah, or 60s. And, and it's something you see immediately. Uh, uh, it was a big part it, of life. You still see it in lowbrow culture. You do. Um, lowbrow culture, of course, being kind of the subgenre around psychobilly, rockabilly music. Yeah, yeah. Um, tattoo art, gonzo yeah. art. Uh, rat rods and hot rods, right? You know, uh, choppers, yeah. Um, and this idea of lowbrow culture because you know, at the time, what are you seeing coming out of Hollywood? Oh, let's see, this is this is the 50s, so you're seeing, um. You're seeing uh, the day the Earth stood still. You're seeing. Um, I'm trying to think of some. Not what we would watch. Not yeah. what we would watch. No. Um, you're seeing a lot of like singing in the rain. Oh, okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. I, that's what I was trying to think of. Some some stuff that 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 m the main culture would be watching. Yeah, you're Hits. seeing a lot of epics. You're seeing a lot of yeah. musicals. You're seeing a lot of. Uh, very family friendly fair. So, Actually, a lot of biblical movies are coming out. A lot of biblical movies. And these stand in stark defiance of those. Yeah, these are rebel movies. Yeah, because, and I think that rebel attitude is really important to what makes, you know, Reagan Gothic. Yeah. Or uh, Radiation Gothic and uh, Psychotronic. Right. Right, because I, I would I would be loath to call the giant Gila monster radiation god. Right, because it's not you can't you can't it's not radiation gothic. Yeah, it's not got the radiation. It's it's rebel without a cause with a lizard. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and and I I can I will tell you, you know, my daddy this this was my father's generation. Mm -hmm. Okay. My father, he probably, I'd say there's a good chance that my father watched this at a drive-in in Bridgeport, Alabama. Um, so what you see, the difference between my grandfather and my father, my grandfather never went out the door without a hat and tie on in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Okay. 
my father would wear a tie at gunpoint. You know, he, he wore blue jeans and and but never wore a tie, never wore a hat unless it was a cowboy hat or a bill cap. Uh, so there there is a huge disconnect between my father's generation and my grandfather's generation. And uh, this is this is what we're seeing. This is their rebel sentiment. And you gotta appreciate like the the way like in the giant Gila monster especially the kids who were thought of as rebels right uh huh are actually pretty good people they're pretty good people that's right they're depicted as like you know pretty stand up guys and girls you know yeah yeah um, and at the end of it Mr Wheeler who's the hill of the flick and represents uh, he represents wealth, power, and that older generation. At the end of it, he comes up and pats Chase on the back and says, "Son, you need a job. Come see me in the morning." Yep. You know, so there's kind of that acceptance by the father figure. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of wish fulfillment, maybe. Yes, absolutely. So do you do you see this kind of thing being done today? Can you think of any like? psychotronic movies being made today that are in the same kind of vein? I don't think... You know, we really don't have a teen culture like this anymore. If you were going to make a psychotronic... I think you could make a psychotronic film like this and make it based on teen culture, but if you were going to do that, it would have to be based on internet and video games as opposed to hot rods and and malt shops and music yeah yeah so So i I think you got to change it up some yeah of course of course you know you got to have tech like i'm reminded of another movie we need to cover at some point yeah Uh, return of the living dead oh yeah you know rebels teenagers you know yeah yeah but that movie's a little more absurdist. Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, by the time that movie was made, you were kind of on the you were on the tr- the tail end of that rebellious teenage generation. Not so much. I'm sure the teenage generation today is just as rebellious. But what you're what you're on the tail end of is the baby boomers. Yeah. And that's really this is this is the, at the beginning of the baby boomer generation, so it doesn't carry the import because of sheer numbers that it did in nineteen in nineteen fifties. And the fear, the fear, have. yeah, the fear, yeah. You know? um, both of these are incredible movies. If you haven't Absolutely. seen them and you've listened this far, then you really ought to need. Them. You really ought to go. Watch you gotta go. You gotta go watch them. You owe it to yourself to watch them. And I gotta, I gotta throw this out here. This is the kind of thing that horror hosts live for. It's the kind of movie that horror hosts live for. They are uh, public domain, which means you can show them, and folks love them. They have a cult following. Both okay. these films have a cult following. So, these these two movies are two of the first I remember really sending me on that deep dive into B movies and psychedelic yes. cinema. Uh, yes. The, these two in a movie called Day of the Equinox. Oh, that's a great flick. Yeah. Sam Raimi owes his whole career to that movie. Yes. Yes, he does. But, uh, and we'll talk about that movie some other time when I can. Absolutely. You know? (laughs) Yes, indeed. We will. We will. But I would encourage everyone to go out and watch these films. And, uh, you know, there's some. James Best is a great actor. Ken Curtis is a great actor. And, uh,. You kind of get a feel. There's something to be said for these guys sitting out in Dallas, Texas, going, you know, I don't have anything going on in Hollywood, so let's create something here in Dallas. 
I like that. That's that's kind of a kind of a neat thing. There's that whole let's put on a show mentality. Yeah, let's put on a show. You know, I'm not getting picked <laughs> up by Universal. Uh, I'm not. I don't have a job on on a on a Western series right now. Let's go out and make a job. So, what in final thoughts? Killer Shrews. Uh, final thoughts on Killer Shrews. You know, it is probably the perfect Saturday night horror host movie. Third movie we did. What you was know. the first? The first was House on Haunted Hill. Ah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta do that one. Gotta do that one. First was House on Haunted Hill, then we did White Zombie, and then we did this one. House on Haunted Hill is almost the elephant in the room when you're talking about late night horror. It is. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it fits into that category. You know, a horror host originally worked off a packet of movies. There were two packet of movies, actually, called uh, Shock Theater and Shock Theater 2. And I think it's something like 36 movies that they could host and show when the station bought them. And if you had to create a modern pack and call it Shock Theater 3, these two films would be in it, and so would House on Haunted Hill. Probably your first three picks. Um, you know, they still do. I remember when I was about 20, uh -huh. I, got, I used to cruise through like the Walmarts, Kmarts, Targets, whatever. And yeah. I would pick up these, what they call horror bundles. Yes. And there would be something like 20 DVDs in there. Yeah. And 40 movies. And it was your Forty shock movies. theater stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and they had different, you know, some of them, one of them was black and white horrors. Another one was, uh, Saturday night specials, which was all yep. hot rods and stuff like that. Yep. Yep. You know, you had some of your gorier ones, you know, yep. but everything was in the public domain. And so I saw a lot of these movies, uh, and these are great party movies, I think. They are great party movies. You turn on the Killer Shrews, you can sit down and watch. It's That's worth right. a watch, right? It is worth a watch. You turn on the turn on the Killer Shrews, uh, you, you mix you a good stiff drink, pop some popcorn, um, whatever else you may have going on at the party, you're mm -hmm. going to have a good time. Yeah. Um, now... The giant Gila monster, same thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great party movie. I think it's a little more subversive in a way. Oh, of course. You got Hot Rodder, Teenage Hot Rodders. It's got to be more subversive. Yeah. Um, and I think that subversion of the norm is important yeah. in these kind of movies and what makes these movies great. Because that's really what we've been talking about is why these movies. Yeah. Why do certain B movies stick around and certain ones fade away? Yeah. Like we'll talk about the robot monster eventually, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes, we will. Uh, my my thesis on that is that the robot monster only makes the cut because the makeup is so out there. Yeah. Yeah. The costume's so out there, you know, the skull head in the bubble with a gorilla suit like it's it's wild it but the here again with that movie the writing is not there and the yeah. acting is not there the cinematography is not there and the people in the movie don't even seem like they're having fun no you know that's like what makes a bad bad movie and a good bad movie. that's the yeah difference. yes um when you watch Manos, The Hands of Fate, nobody seems like they're having fun. Including you. <laughs> nobody's having a good time. Nobody's having a good time. No. <laughs> not you, not the guy making it, not the guy producing it, not yep, the guy yep. in it. You know? Nope, nope. Nobody's enjoying themselves. No, no. But in these, there's a real 
let's put on a show. Let's pretend like this giant beaded lizard is actually a Gila monster, and let's go. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that makes it fun to watch. It makes it, you know, there's some, uh, and when I show these shows and I've got an audience, uh, killer, not killer, it's giant Gila monster. Uh, the scenes, the musical scenes, scenes, where you've got uh, uh, Don Sullivan playing and singing, and uh, that that really gets me. Of course, they they poke fun at it, but yeah. they're talking about it. You know that that those are scenes that people enjoy, and the, the scene where he's singing to his sister. I mean, you cannot get a more soppy, <laughs> more soppy oh, scene yeah. than that. You know, she's on the braces, and he's singing her a song, and but it works. Yeah, it works. The whole thing works. The whole thing works. You know, so it's kind of like this subversive, rebellious teenage movie meets a prehistoric monster movie meets a tug at your heartstrings movie you know I mean, it's all it's got it all they yes. packed it all into an hour and 20 minutes or however long the, the show is well uh that's another thing we didn't really touch on these are very short movies they're very short movies yes yeah. yes yeah they're giant, they're they're short the giant Gila monster clocks in at 75 minutes yeah and oof Killer Shrews at 69 minutes. Yep, barely an hour. Barely over an hour. Yep. Wow, you know? Of course, at a drive-in, you're going to fill that with a lot of fluff. Yeah. You know, there's there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of teasers promoting food. There's going to be a local advertising. There's probably going to be a short or a cartoon. So it's not that big a deal. Well, I've enjoyed talking about these. I have too, and um, I want to tell everybody we do have an email now. Uh, the Reapers Digest Five at Gmail dot com. So if you want to talk with us about something, just shoot us an email. Um, suggestions for things we want to cover. Yeah, absolutely. Suggestions for things you that we want to cover. Things you'd like to see shoot us an email and let us know if you enjoyed this we certainly hope you did buy us a cup of coffee go to ko-fi.com backslash tennessee macabre and uh leave us a tip yeah we promise we won't use it on uh anything illicit hey i didn't say anything about that that's, that's, <laughs> that's the disclaimer that's that's for oh okay okay yeah okay we won't use it on anything illicit yeah. Also, <laughs> make sure <laughs> make sure that uh, you follow us on Facebook. And we also have a YouTube site now. So go to our YouTube site, click and subscribe. All right. Until next time, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you for choosing the Reaper's Digest Podcast. Like and like subscribe. subscribe. Recommend like us to your friends. Your friend. Check us Check out on all, all social, social media, media outlets. outlets. We'll see you next time. time.